Welcome to today's episode of the Simply Financial Podcast. I'm your host, Christopher Calandra. Would like to increase your financial IQ with today's episode. I have a guest. I was curious about a few things related to the property and casualty insurance market, which has been problematic in many ways. And so uh, I asked uh, a friend of mine, Stephen Hunt, he is a principal at Fahey Insurance in Connecticut. It's about been around for a few decades. And uh, to come on and talk about the state of the property and casualty insurance market in 2024. Steve, thanks for coming on with me today. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I'm looking forward to it. So people that are listening probably will know sort of what the first question should be. And hopefully I answer their requests. And that is property insurance rates have gone up a lot over the last couple of years. And researching for our discussion today, um, I think uh, property insurance rates have increased some 38% from 2019 through 2024. So could you talk about some of the key factors that are driving prices up? So so I I, I, I agree. I said, I, so that 38% that number, um, you know, is probably a pretty good number. Um, but I, I think, I think it's one of those, those numbers, almost like the weather where they say, yeah, it's, it's 42 degrees out, but with the wind chill, it feels like it's 25. Um, I think that 38% number is a great number, but it feels like a hundred percent. Um, yeah. because, because there's certain categories of insurance that have been hit extremely hard. So if you blend auto property and all of that, maybe it's 38%, but if you look at just property alone, it's probably more 50 plus um, percent. Um, I believe. I, yeah, yeah. So it's, it's it's like I said, I like that weather analogy, right? It's the, the real yeah. feel of a uh, 100% uh, increase. Um, the... Uh, there, the, the, there's a couple of, re- I mean, there's a, there's a myriad of reasons for it, but I'll, I'll simplify it into a couple, right? So, so it really, really started um, in 2020 when COVID came along. So in a, from a property perspective, um, certain parts of our country, especially the Northeast have very old buildings, right? Um, much of the Northeast was built in the late 1800s and early 1900s. So everything is approaching a hundred plus years old. Um, many laws and codes and building ordinances and all of that have evolved and changed over many, many years, but that doesn't necessarily mean all of that, those laws have been applied to all of these buildings, right? So what happens is you have a property loss and it might not look like much from the outside, but when you open up the walls, right, that you find all sorts of, uh, construction that's out of code whether it's electrical, HVAC, plumbing, all of those items. So you may have a simple pipe burst and all you see is some water spots on some sheetrock, right? But you go to take the sheetrock out and, you know, fix the loss and you and the cause of the leak and you find out, oh my God, all my plumbing and all my electrical and everything's out of code. There's asbestos in my walls, right? So what looks like it might only be three or $4,000 to fix is by the time you're done, it's a hundred grand, right? Because- the laws are set up to where the insurance policies have to step in and fix everything, not just the loss, not just the little micro loss that you can see visually and you have to replace all of it. So that's that's one of the huge factors that's affecting, especially the Northeast and the Northern Midwest, you know, the big metro areas like the Chicago, right. the New Yorks that have been around, all the Bostons that have been around a long time. It's a lot of it is losses that look like not much that end up being substantially more. I got a perfect example, house in West Hartford, 1920 construction, a uh, shower pan on the second floor was slowly leaking over time, right? Every time they took a shower, a little bit of water's getting out of the shower pan somehow. And this homeowner went down in their basement one day and noticed a little puddle on their floor, you know, three levels below the bathroom. And they go, oh, I wonder what this is all about. So and plumber comes over, they trace the water, they figure out, oh, it's a leaky shower pan. $174,000 later, the house is put back together, right? Because they find, they find, oh, it's coming into the shower pan. Let's open up the floor in the bathroom. And then they see mold everywhere. 
and the water runs its way down and they got to replace, they're going to rip the kitchen ceiling out. Oh, uh, it's a 1920s house. We got exposed knob and tube wiring. We got to replace all of that electrical, right? All So it was $170-ish thousand to, to fix a little leaky a leaky drain. So that's, that's, that's what's happening quite a bit. I think um, part of it, thank you for explaining that. I think part of it too is we as homeowners have seen appreciation in our homes quite a bit mm -hmm. over the last couple of years, starting with COVID, as you cited in your previous example. So if if you have a home that went up 25, 30, 40, in some parts of the country, 50% over the last couple of years, wouldn't you expect everything else being equal that insurance premiums would have to chase that and go up to keep up with the valuations of the homes, Correct. including placement values, right? Correct. Yeah. So you're, so you hit on a great, a great thing that I actually wasn't going to talk about. Um, but oh. <laughs> that's, that's a, that's a, that's a, no, but I, cause I, that's an honestly one of the huge factors. So what's, what, what's going on in insurance is because of the banking regulations, specifically the Dodd-Frank act, I believe that was, uh, back in that's a Connecticut thing. I think that was back in like 08, right after the housing crisis, 09. Yes. Right. Yep. So, so now it, they, they've made it, they've made it much more difficult to qualify for a mortgage. Right. So because, or, or, or I, I should say more stringent underwriting, right. Actually people get, are getting loans that they have to prove they can actually afford the loans. Like you didn't need to before. Right. So, so now um, the challenge that that's created is, is, that the the banks are very very particular about what your insurance policy has to provide they are asking for guaranteed replacement cost right so if there is a loss on a home they want to make sure there's absolutely enough insurance to put that house back together to not jeopardize the the cash flow of the homeowner which jeopardizes their ability to pay their mortgage right so they've built into these 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 regular the guaranteed replacement costs. So what happens is if you're going to have that endorsement on a policy and building materials go up, cost of skilled labor goes up, right? Well, what has to also go up? The value of your home, right? The replacement cost right. value of your home. We have, a, I can speak to Connecticut and I can speak to Florida right now. Um, you have a, a, a dichotomy in both states, right? You have an Eastern Massachusetts, Massachusetts is also in this, this category. Um, certain pockets of these areas, the replacement cost or the construction cost is still substantially higher than the market value of the home itself. Okay. Now market values have crept up, right? But still we're outpacing the construction cost in a most of Connecticut, right? In most of Florida is still more than the market value of the home. So the challenge you that that it becomes is is you know you, the, the for the policy to guarantee replacement cost, right? You may have only paid five hundred thousand for that home, but your replacement cost might be over a million because if you had to actually build that home right now, it would cost you a million plus. So you're paying insurance on a home value mm -hmm. like you just built it, as opposed to what what you paid for it, and that's oftentimes a difficult. So what's happening is as building materials and skilled labor goes up well so is your replacement cost it's called inflation guards most most carriers are hitting you eight between eight and twelve percent on the value of the replacement value of the home which drives your premium up and then they're hitting you with a base rate increase to cover all of the other items that i discussed before with the losses and all that you know how how much they are costing to repair now right right so you're getting hit twice Right. You're getting just based. The rate itself is going up eight, 10 percent. And then the insure, we call it ITV, insured to value or, or TIV, total insurable value. You're getting hit with TIV at the same time. So, yeah, it's only an eight percent, 10 percent rate increase. But it feels like 20 or 30 because you're getting hit twice on the policy. And the sure. consumer at the end of the day, they only care what the premium is, not how you calculated it. So you're getting you're getting whacked twice. Um, oh, yeah. In a lot of cases. So you touched on this. Inflation is part of this, right? Because again, coming out of COVID, we had a significant inflation issue in the United States. Here at Elliott Wealth Management, we've talked extensively about it because it has been a central economic issue starting in early 2021. 
but that's part of it too, right? Insurance companies are seeing the inflation in home prices. You mm -hmm. touched on this, the inflation in cost of goods, you know, to hire a plumber and electrician for their labor, that's gone up. For the materials, that's gone up. Regulations have gone up. And also just in their own expense profile at the insurance carriers, you know, their labor costs have gone up, their health insurance program costs have gone up, uh, their, you know, everything has gone up. And all of that contributes to what we've seen with these premium increases, right? Correct, correct. So I wanna I wanna I wanna touch on something that the that the carriers are really, really dealing with. So to 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 answer that question. So we talked a little bit about, and it's hard to condense all of this into 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 a few minutes here, but but the, yeah, the we're doing a high level, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. So 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 yeah, there's the property issues, right? And then there's the legal issue. Let's jump over to auto insurance really quick, right? Yeah. So let's let's really quick, we're gonna talk about the physical side of the car, right? Cars are expensive now. Right. Everything's more expensive. So your fender bender 15 years ago might have been twenty five hundred bucks. Well, that's eight, ten thousand now because you got you got sensors in the bumpers. You got cameras. I mean, you rip a mirror off your car. Right. You used to be able to go on. You go to Keystone Auto Mall, Auto Mart online, buy your mirror for two hundred bucks. You know, go go pay the auto body guy a hundred bucks cash to screw it back on your car and you're, you're off and running. Right. Well, now you've got a turn signal in the mirror. It's heated right? It's electric. You can control the, the mirror, right? So now just the mirror's a thousand bucks for the part itself. And then the auto body guy is going to charge you 500 to put it on. So what used, you know, what 10 years ago used to be $400 whoops is now a $1,500 whoops. I know that from experience. I was at uh, a Yukon hockey game two years ago and I was parking between a fence and a snowbank in a, like a construction fence, like a temporary fence. And I caught my passenger side mirror on the fence and ripped it right off the car and it cost me $1,500. Um, so, so that's, that's a, that's a real life, uh, real life uh, example. But so, so what's happening is that, you know, really quick is the vehicles are higher value now, right? So a fender bender is 10, 12,000 uh, where it used to be that, but the big problem in auto um, is the litigation side. Um, it is massive it's growing, it's getting worse. And that is what's causing, costing the carriers all the money. And that's what's driving up the cost of auto insurance. It is, it is unbelievable. The, the, the percentage of lawyer representation in a car accident has quadrupled over the last five years. You'll notice when you drive around certain states, you're seeing you drive up and down 84 in Connecticut. All you see is billboards for personal injury attorneys. Yeah. Where are they getting all the money? You know, it's, it costs like $15,000 a month to have a billboard in Connecticut, right? Mm -hmm. When you see law firms that started 10 years ago from scratch and they've got billboards all the way up and down 84 and all the way up and down 91, you know, they're, they're dropping a million bucks a year on billboards, right? Where's that money coming from? Okay. Mm -hmm. It's private equity is funding litigation now. Okay. So what's happening is all the brilliant financial wizards that have piles of money are trying to figure out how to use it. So what they've realized is we can fund personal injury firms and take 10% of settlements. So we're feeding them all the cash flow they need for their marketing, right? And to grow them. And now we're getting a piece of the pie of every single settlement in the in the in the world because they are funding it and they're making money hand over fist right now on litigation settlements. They call it social inflation. That's the buzzword. Yeah. yeah. So the le the legal costs for legal settlements and just more of them and the courts are expensive to deal with takes a long time. So I, I get that. I hadn't thought of that. Let's um let's switch gears for a moment. We are recording this just after we had two notable hurricanes in the Southern United States, Helene and then Milton. So I'm curious about this. So these are events that affected states like Florida, I think Texas a little bit, Tennessee, North Carolina, Georgia kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, but when, when these happen and you have these huge losses in these areas, 
if you're in other parts of the country, you're in Connecticut, you're in Colorado, you're in South Dakota, do your premiums ultimately go up because of losses happening in the southern part of the U.S.? Yes. Yes. So the reason well, that's not a good answer, huh? That's not a good answer. Yeah, but but it's yes because because it's a it's a macro thing, right? We're all in this pool together. The whole country. We can just speak for the whole country right now, not the whole world. We're all in this insurance pool together. All right. So if there's many national carriers that have presence in those states you represented. Travelers, Chubb, um, AIG, Pure, the Harford, right? All of these big brand names that we see on TV, State Farm, Nationwide, All State, right? They're all, all over the country. Every insurance carrier buys reinsurance, all right? So if you have a million dollar lot and you burn your house down, it's a million dollar house and they, the carrier's writing you a check for a million dollars, right? Only a percentage of that million is actually coming from your insurer's piggy bank, right? right. The rest of it's coming from their reinsurance carrier. So when these massive situations happen with the weather and massive loss, the reinsurance carriers get tapped, Right. And they have to they have to pay out on their claims. So what happens is they have to raise their rates on the insurance companies, which means the insurance companies have to raise their rate on the end user or the, the, the insured. Um, the reinsurance marketplace is drying up rapidly. Many, many reinsurers are at capacity and they're not willing to give any more capacity to certain insurers. Right. Right. So, and there's not that many reinsurance companies out there. And there's only like 30, okay? So all these carriers all over the country are buying their reinsurance from the same places, right? So mm -hmm. if so, that's why the reinsurance carriers are spreading that rate amongst all insurance carriers, which drive the rates up over the whole country. It isn't, isn't Florida an example of this? Because doesn't Florida, the state of Florida provide reinsurance for the state or have some right. program that provides reinsurance, right? Correct. So that's an example of there's not a great private market solution. So the state has had to step in to support the market, right? Correct. And we've had a problem with flood. The NFIP, which is the National Flood Insurance Program, has almost run out of money every yeah. year for the last seven to 10 years, right? So that's a massive problem. Think of all of the, all of the coastal in river exposure we have in our country, wherever there could be flooding, right? It's it's massive. These two hurricanes, the biggest concern has been the storm surge and the flooding. There is a substantial amount of multi-million dollar loss that's uninsured because people have elected to not buy flood. The reason for that is the NFIP shut everybody off at one point. So the private flood market has taken over where you have private insurers that aren't anything to do with the federal government or FEMA, they are using the same coverage forms, but underwriting it themselves and pricing it themselves. And that has taken over, right? In a lot of ways, but they, a lot of them, they're very smart and they won't offer coverage in certain areas, right? Good luck right. buying buying flood insurance in Houston from the private right. flood market. Good luck buying it on the West coast or East coast of Florida, right? Mm -hmm. they're, they're, they're smart enough to sit there and go, hey, I don't know that I, you know, we have a certain capacity once we reach that capacity and those zip codes we're done right we're not yeah. taking on any more risk so that's 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 why these storms even though they they happen very super regionally specific right they're 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 going to impact the entire country because here's the other thing nobody thinks about this right there's only so many people that can adjust claims right so if you have a massive event like this right all of these carriers are deploying all of their claim adjustment resources to these areas. So that doesn't mean there's no claims happening in Connecticut right now because everyone's down right. in Florida, right? So you have a pipe burst in your house in Southington, Connecticut, right? You might not be able to get an adjuster to your house for two weeks. Mm -hmm. right? What is right, that? They're cost? Strange. Yeah. What does that cost? The, the carrier has to pay for you to live some, somewhere else. So the longer it takes for them, to adjust your loss drives your total claim cost up because there's there's stale stagnant time because all the resources are dealing it's a triage effect right they got to go where the biggest problem is and then work backwards from there 
right? So that's that's the impact on the whole country. That, I mean, I have claims going on right now where adjusters aren't calling people back for a week or two because they're in Florida. They're yeah. down in Florida trying to figure that mess out. So it's it's a it's a whole dynamic. So I was excited to have this conversation. It's it's a it's a little depressing because it's it's problematic and consumers yeah. know it. They're being hit in their pocketbooks and their sticker shock. I know personally, personally, uh, I'm blessed. I have two homes. I also have some investment properties. So I mean, I go through this. So uh, I understand what's going on. And you you filled in quite a bit of the background on some of the factors that is driving all of this. So. What advice do you have for consumers that are trying to cope with these changes and these premium increases and the pressures on the carriers? Because as a side note, I know some politicians will accuse these insurance car carriers of gouging, but that's not happening, right? This is just this is just They're a money. marketplace mess with lots of different contributing factors. Um, but it's not simply... XYZ company is gouging, right? We could agree on that. Yeah, so I what? Think, what I, think, you, go ahead. Go ahead. I think I think the political. I'm not. I don't want to get into a political conversation, um, but the political landscape has a massive impact on what's going on right now, right? The 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 programs in the desires of one party are very different than the programs in the desires of the other party, right? And the disagreement, if you will, between the two parties is causing problems in the courts, right? In 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 the regulation, the regulatory bodies that kind of govern how all of this stuff works. Um, so so therefore, that stalemate, that inability to agree on things, right, is causing stagnation, right? Right. Which is a major problem. If you if you're not moving forward, you're moving backwards. Right. You, no, so, but because the rules are on in many instances, the rules are unclear. So it makes correct. things messy. Right. And so, the Department of Insurance does not agree, is not allowing the insurance carriers to do what they need to do to correct the problem. Right. So they think the DOI, Department of Insurance, thinks they're protecting the consumer by blocking rate increases. But all they're doing is limiting options for the buyers in certain areas because the way carriers look at this is they go to the department of insurance and in whatever state they're 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 working in and they say hey you know we need because of reinsurance because of losses because of the laws in your state and what that causes us to pay in a claim we need to raise our rate 18 percent okay the doi will say nope nope we're only going to allow you eight percent so the carrier will sit there and go, well, we can't turn a profit in your state if you only allow us to raise our rate 8%. So what we're going to do instead is we're no longer going to offer insurance in your state, right? Yep. Which diminishes the buyer's options. I got an example, a house on the coast. Um, he was paying, I don't know, it's a big house. He was paying like $15,000 a year in premium um, on the coast. It was in Long Island. Right. He's paying 15000 a year for premium and his carrier non-renewed him because the Department of Insurance would not allow the 21 percent rate increase they wanted in those zip codes. All right. So what's 21 percent of 15000? We all know the number. 3000. Yeah. So that that would be a three thousand dollar increase. So he'd go from 15000 to 18000. Well, the Department of Insurance would not allow that carrier to put that rate increase through. So that carrier non-renewed all the policies and pulled out of that area. So now the only option I could find my customer was 30 grand. So if the carrier, if the DOI let my, that carrier put the rate increase through, he's insured for 18,000 instead of the 30 grand I had to place him because that was the only option available for him. So to make sure, to make sure I'm following this correctly and listeners are following this correctly, you have the Department of Insurance, whose mission is to run an orderly market. They have their way of looking at things. But mm -hmm. then other elements of the government have their own agenda. And they're actually putting pressure on the carriers because the Department of Insurance is trying to keep a lid on the pricing. But other parts of government are increasing obligations of the insurance carriers and the homeowners or the right. auto owners, whatever the property people are. And so that's creating this contributing to the problem too. Is that a good summary? Hundred percent. Wow. I, 
spot on. And you're hitting a topic I wanted to discuss in a prior question that that I that I think is a a a vitally important aspect here. It's called social inflation. We've all heard the term. All right. But what it means in layman's terms to a guy like me sitting in my chair is they call it the, the social inflation is causing what's called the nuclear verdict. Have you ever heard of a nuclear verdict, Chris? No. All right. A nuclear verdict is the jury in a court awarding an, an absorbent amount of money to um, a damaged party. OK. OK. The amount of I read an article in insurance journal yesterday, which the timing couldn't have been better. Uh, getting in prep in preparation for this conversation, they said social inflation in the United States is up on average fourteen point one percent right now. And what that means is basically jury jury awards. So juries are voting right now in cases after they hear a case, they're 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 awarding based on their feelings, based on the social economic issues in the world. Mm -hmm. Right? Is this per, where does this person that's got in, that got rear-ended and in, in uh, you know has a neck injury? Where are they from? Did they grow up in a wealthy community? Did they grow up in a in a housing project? What can we do? How can we help this person through this? How could let's? I feel bad for this person because they've had a tough road and they got in this car accident. So let's let's because to make ourselves feel good. Let's let's give them ten million dollars in this case, right? When the facts of the case don't actually represent that, they're, they're that's that's the real issue in the courts right now is this social inflation. The UK, their social inflation rate right now is only four percent, and the reason for that being most of the small tort, right, the small tort stuff, which is your under fifty thousand dollar settlements, are being yeah. handled by a judge by themselves, no jury. Right. Mm -hmm. So if you're in a minor fender bender and, you know, you had to go to physical therapy for a few weeks and, you know, you've got 15 grand in medical bills and you had to miss three weeks of work. Right. All you're getting paid is your in the UK is your 15 grand in medical bills and whatever your lost wages were from when you weren't at work. Fair is fair. You're put back together. You're good. You take that same case and you bring it to the US and you go in front of a jury. They make it a million bucks. Yeah, that's wow. that's the biggest issue. In insurance right now, that is what's driving up the cost of everything. That that's is, not and that plays into the political landscape a little bit, which we'll stay away from. But that's that's what's really going on right now, and that is something that is not talked about in the media. That is not something that's ever out and about for the general public. My sister has been a personal injury paralegal for twenty seven years. Okay, she's top of the food chain um, when it comes to She's basically a lawyer without having to go to law school. All right. Okay. She, she's the best in the business. She's been doing it for so long. She's been at every kind of firm from, you know, the entry level, uh, you know, personal injury firm that's just settling $10,000 cases over and over again to now she's at a very high end firm where they're dealing with medical malpractice, big, big situations, right. That are you know, where people are severely damaged and are, are, oh, they're, they're big cases. Right. So, the amount of times people, she gets phone calls from the scene of a car accident before the police are called. Okay. She'll literally answer the phone and they'll be like, I just got in a car accident. You know, can you help me? I haven't called the police yet. Can you, what do I need to say and do here to make sure I'm in a position to get paid? That's incredible. And that's that that is the core we need tort reform is the biggest issue in our in our in the insurance industry right now well, um, i think that's a, a good place to leave this discussion as we wrap up though i think a moment ago you described yourself as a layman anybody listening to this including me would not describe you as a layman you're clearly an expert in your field i talk at the top of the show about wanting to increase my listeners financial iq I seriously increased my own IQ related to the insurance market. This has been a revelation. Um, we had limited time today. Will you come back and do another episode with me? Because there's other things I was hoping to explore with you. And I might just be scratching my own itch. But I have a feeling my listeners would like this um, to continue. Will you? I'm putting you on the spot. Will you come back? Yeah, 100%. I think the question that you asked me about what consumers can do uh, to to manage their situation right now and the pros and cons of using a direct carrier versus an independent agent. I think those two questions could be its own podcast by itself. Yeah, there you go. Let's do that. Right? 
So um, especially with, especially that question, I'll leave you on a cliffhanger here. Yeah. I have a lot, a lot of advice on how consumers can deal with this. Right. But that, that mine as well, there's a con a concept I need to deliver for that question. And then a actual protocol to move right. forward with that concept. So I think we should table those two for another, another 25 minute episode. I love it, Steve. If uh, anyone listening wants to get in touch with you, how could they go about reaching out to you and your team? So the yeah, we've been we've been in business since 1964. Uh, the name of the business is Thomas Fay Insurance Agency. Uh, we are in West Hartford, Connecticut. If you just hop on Google, you'll find my website. You'll find all my socials. There's there's and we're very very easy to find. Um, the the website is Fay F A H Y Insurance dot com. Um, you just hop on there and all my contact information, my whole team, everybody's there. Um, so just, uh, if you're looking for me up on Google, you can also Google my name and uh, I'll pop right up. All right. Awesome. Thank you so much, Stephen. Again, Thanks, it was uh, very, uh, educational. Appreciate it. Have a great Appreciate one. It. Thanks, Chris. Take care. The views expressed are not necessarily the opinion of Osaic Wealth, Inc., and should not be construed directly or indirectly as an offer to buy or sell any securities mentioned herein. Investing is subject to risks, including loss of principal invested. Past performance is not a guarantee of future results. No strategy can assure a profit nor protect against loss. Please note that individual situations can vary. Therefore, the information should be relied upon when coordinated with individual professional advice. Please note, the information being provided is strictly as a courtesy. When you link to any of the websites provided here, you are leaving this website. We make no representation as to the completeness or accuracy of information provided at these websites. Nor is the company liable for any direct or indirect technical or system issues or any consequences arising out of your access to or your use of third-party technologies, websites, information, and programs made available through this website. When you access one of these websites, you are leaving our website and assume total responsibility and risk for your use of the websites you are linking to. Securities and advisory services are offered through Osaic Wealth, Inc., member FINRA, SIPC, insurance services offered through Elliott Wealth Management Services, LLC, not affiliated with Osaic Wealth, Inc.